<laughs> she's gonna be sharing with us the, this presentation, expressing ourselves on the battlefield and stepping into machines. Um, Nina comes from a, an extensive dance and performance background, and she situates her work within the fine arts, questioning choreography via, beyond its performative state. Using moving image, sound, performance, and fiction, her practice aims to further critical discussion around dance by observing how it intersects with language and where it begins to take on commodify or material forms. Her work has been exhibited and shown at the Overmorrow House, Battle, Alchemy Film and Moving Image Festival, Hogwick, Sager Gallery in London, Robota, Center for Advanced Studies, and many others. She is also the co-host of Future Artifacts FM with artist Niam Schmidtke, which is a radio program focusing on fictional works intended for broadcast, such as radio plays, soundscapes, and fictional interviews to carve out a better understanding of the now by exploring various interpretations of the future. So thank you so much, Nina, for coming with us, and the floor is yours. Cool. Um, so I... So I'm going to start with showing the video Express Yourself on the Battlefield, which kind of lays out the, um, lays out the situation of dance becoming a rather commodifiable form. But before I go into that, I just kind of want to like give a little bit of a brief introduction, because I used to be a dancer and kind of came into the art world uh, going into my BA, so it's been like a long time ago, and bringing dance into the art space and kind of expecting to studying under didn't have the language to talk about it, so it kind of set me out on this mission to be like, why can't people talk about dance, but like it's really hard to have a critical conversation about dance in the same way that people are having about sculpture and uh, painting. Um, and I kind of started to get interested in the copyright laws for dance and how there was no form of fixation, or like law of notation in form of fixation, but it's not widely used, and it's kind of a quite a specialized form and really expensive to, uh, to actually have done if you want to get a work uh, notated. So law of notation, for those who don't know, is a form of notation for dance. Um, and then a few years later I came across these um, court cases between dancers um, and actors and musicians against uh, ethnic games, or likely the use and sale of the choreography. Um, Um, and I won't explain any more, I'll just go into the, into the video. Um, and this was made before we started thinking about blockchain or like, this is quite early on, this would be two years ago. So the beginning part is a little bit redundant now, so bear with it, bear with me. This video explores the concepts behind a proposal for needed amendments to the choreographic copyright laws. No longer an incomplete commodity, dances can now be bought in virtual online markets to be performed by avatars to communicate and experience the world of online gaming. This proposal will suggest a new set of protocols for protecting the reproduction of choreography in digital bodies, especially when sold for cash value. This proposal will demand that the use of dances too short to be protected under current copyright laws be included when being reproduced as code. This proposal will not attempt to change the laws concerning social dances being reproduced by real bodies, as it's important to highlight that coded dances are a product of labour, which requires compensation or accreditation. This video is not the proposal, but rather an exploration of the dancing body as a commodity. 
tonight, I'm going out dancing. The club is an hour's journey from me, one train and a bus. I don't like getting dressed up. It is more important that I am comfortable. I must not forget my phone and my earphones. I will need them for the long journey. Currently, I'm listening to the Red Dead Redemption soundtrack. It's a weird choice, but I like to replace the ceiling of the train with open blue skies and a light breeze. For a moment, I go someplace else. I do my favorite dance. I like to do it in slow motion, as I like the way my hair moves. I am not myself here, but I can see myself having fun. I take out my earphones when I get to the club. It's noisy and quiet at the same time. I can no longer see myself. I feel heavy and tired. I'm not sure why I came here or what I'm supposed to do in this space. What if our bodies could exist in imaginary spaces? Could they be separated from our physicality? The iPod commercial proposes this space and body. The iPod is a digital device which allows your body to transcend into a non-space. You're both dancing and still at the same time. Whose body is it? Your own? Or is it the body of another? This body isn't necessarily real, but the experience is. It is even more fleeting than moments of real dancing, but also can be perfectly repeated over and over again in your mind. It's important to address the notion of property as it's central to this work. Property is something of ownership, a possession. It's transferable and therefore able to exist separately from its creator or manufacturer. For property to be transferable, it must be materialized to a certain extent. This materialization takes the form of a product. If creative expression is the product, it must exist in a material form a score, a book, a script, a record. Regardless of whether we're looking at the products of mass production or creative expression, it's clear that the labor can be estranged from the product. But what happens when the labor is the product? The act of dancing is both product and service. For it to become a product, it always requires the service of dancing. In this sense, it can never be a fully materialised commodity. Let's return to the notion of disembodiment. But not this one. With the aid of media, dance can exist on the screens of our phones. It's able to exist in some way as a material object. Here we are not dancing, but possessing and consuming it. To experience dance, we no longer have to rely on attending a performance or a party. <laughs> It's always at our disposal. An 
an arm's reach from our pocket or bag, not in a body. But this is not dance in its fully digitised form. Motion capture technology allows for human movement to be recorded for the use of moving image and video games. This technology is used to make characters more believable, as the dynamics of human movement are difficult to recreate without a body. By using motion capture, a record can now be created. This is the separation of labour and product that can allow creative expression to become a form of transferable property. If the creator of a work is illiterate in the technology and economy that allows it to become a form of property, this can create a complicated relationship between author and product. There's a lot to be said about the battlefield as a place to express oneself. The battlefield in this sense is the setting of a game, and the expression is a series of coded gestures. Gaming companies own these emotes and sell them for in-game currency, which is purchased with real-life currency. This is how games like Fortnite make their profit. It's through the various add-ons that allow a player to personalise and customise their avatar. The dances, therefore, become an item for ownership, the emote menu acting as one's pocket or bag. Choreographic material is not created by the game. The first versions of the game saw dances copied from internet, TV and music video sensations. Fortnite's developers were taken to court by dancers, musicians and actors for the use and renaming of their work. The dancers lost their cases. For some, it was because they didn't register their work for copyright beforehand. For others, it's because the phrases were too short. After these court cases, Fortnite adopted new modes of generating choreography. Instead of working alongside choreographers or dance makers, they used social media sites like YouTube and TikTok as sites of production. They did this by using the dance challenge phenomenon popularised on TikTok. Winners were awarded their dance turned into an emote as well as in-game currency, which cannot be exchanged into real-life currency. It's here that the choreographer became the labourer as opposed to the artist, alienated from the products they create. Dance challenges become assembly lines for products that allow people to express themselves on the battlefield. In the age of surveillance capitalism, our personal actions and activities are being flipped for profit for the benefit of someone else. We've become increasingly alienated from the products of our labour, and at times are unable to recognise these actions as labour. With a long history of dancers fighting for authorship and protection of their work, gaming companies have beat them to it by successfully turning our dances into products. It could be helpful for us to begin to consider our actions as property, as the digital realm can seem just as ephemeral as the moving body. A Google search can be as fleeting as a flick of the wrist, but put together they become a product which can be sold. started kind of talking about um, you know thinking 
talking about to the beginning of my film, I kind of say that like the laws need to be changed, having like really not that much uh, knowledge of like how the legal system works. It's sort of, I was trying to th basically separate this sort of there's a um, uh, dancers who've been kind of fighting for uh, get, being able to get their work, the co copyrights for their work when it's being passed down from body to body. It's a really difficult thing to do. And what I wanted to kind of set out with this video is that we're kind of looking at a completely different framework here. Um, and it's not really about uh, dance that's being passed down from body to body. It's about it being codified So, um, and that's so that's the one of the things with copyright laws for dance is that a dance is too short, which we learned about yesterday, or it's not complex enough, can't be copywritten. Um, social dances aren't able to be copywritten either, which um, is extremely problematic because uh, it's sort of this there's this question of who's social and who's professional, and it, there's this thing: do you belong to a specific social group? Uh, what you make within that group of people that you belong to is not considered intellectual property. Whereas if you do a pastiche of it, if you're from a different community and do a pastiche of this dance, you are allowed to, it, it is considered your intellectual property. Um, and so I, we were kind of, I was coming to it from like looking at these dancers on TikTok, mostly kids who are creating these dances. Um, and then Jorge's also coming So in a weird way those kind of those two things really line up. Um, and it was interesting to kind of for, foreground um, protecting traditional dances. And if that can be something that we spearhead our research with, it has a sort of knock on effect with these social, these online social groups. Um, so so we kind of came up with these spec in our book that we wrote recently. provides a score in some sense and uh, also can suddenly make a, like a quite simple seeming dance uh, suddenly quite complex like you know two moves can suddenly be like what is it we ended up with yeah hundreds of pages of data um, so we were kind of speculative thinking thinking like could you copyright um, could you copy could you protect dances under source code So that was kind of one thing. Well, the, these things are what kind of stuff we think about. Um, and uh, yes, that's motion capture is a form of fixation. And also you've had um, Jorge's done some projects of making motion capture more accessible and easier to use, like more user friendly. And those, uh, those technologies kind of exist in our phones. It's like not, you don't have to have like a state of the art lab like this. You can do it yourself. Um, and then also we were kind of looking at blockchain as um, wondering whether it can provide this you know, sort of timestamps, stop timestamps of when you create something, whether it could uh, be used as evidence um, moving forward. And of course this was something that we were talking about probably a year ago when we didn't really know much about blockchain. Um, so after the you know, course of these two days, my thinking has kind of matured a bit. Um, so, but we wanted to go back to like, of course, there's like, we wanted to look, go back to like, what's at stake? So there's, um, of course, there's dancers, be it needing to be uh, paid for their work um, and acknowledged for their work, but also there's, um, <laughs> but also traditional knowledges are also something that, that is at stake and has been at stake for a long time with people copying dance moves um, or people reusing uh, dances in environments where the traditional knowledges are not necessarily not necessary to within the frameworks that they're in. Um, so we kind of wanted to think about is there a way that we can in rethinking um, how dances are uh, restaged and reused, is there a way of trying to uh, think 
also try and include in the conversation how these traditional knowledges can be kept within, uh, within dances. Um, so, firstly, I just want to talk about how I, what I mean also when I say traditional slash folk dance. Um, so it can usually be, it can, dances or traditional dances can usually fit under like these four pillars, um, which are fertility dances, dances of war, agricultural dances, and spiritual dances. Of course, these four categories are, they, they split out uh, further, like uh, dances of resistance can fit into dances of war, and it like, yeah, it's expansive. Um, and so they, they respond to, um, they kind of used to describe, like, they used to signify like what the human experience was, and they used to have, and if not still, had like a sort of functional value to society. So a perfect example of this would be a fertility dance, uh, where you do a dance, you meet a mate, you maybe make a baby. Like, they, they actually has a, a reaction to it. It does something. It's not just like purely aesthetics. Um, and not that that is necessarily what happens all the time. Um, and so I think I sort of wanted to think about um, the fact that these dances are not made in a vacuum, which is once these knowledges start to disintegrate, they do just become aesthetics, especially when it starts to get adopted by advertising industries. I mean, it just doesn't mean anything anymore. Um, so yeah, so an example is like um, dances can tell stories of the past, warnings of the future, and they can propose to have life's new beginnings. Um, so, oh, I'm just gonna. So we decided to adopt uh, fiction as a method moving forward in testing some of these speculative, uh, these speculative courses of action. Um, and so I just included this here because it's a really good book, um, if any of you have heard of it. Um, and it talks about um, using fiction as a method, but also it kind of explains how fiction exists. So, um, the fact that like rivers are given legal personhood, uh, corporations are given legal personhood, that's like a, that's a kind of form of fiction, if the, of course a company is not a person, um, but it's given legal, it's given, uh, is seen under the law as some by the same way as having humans. Um, and the same with like fiction, like the novel was first invented for the bourgeois to be able to talk about, or the people to be able to talk about. Uh, the bourgeois class and what they were doing wrong because you weren't allowed to actually talk about what people were doing. Gossip was not like seen as able to be done. So people would write this allegorical text to kind of uh, signify uh, problems in society. So yeah, so I kind of came across this book and I would suggest it to Paul that we, um, why don't we make a, tradi a, a fictional traditional dance. Um, and because at first we were thinking, oh, it would be really great to um, to work with a traditional dancer, like you know, kind of include someone in, as a part of this research and think through these ideas of how uh, dance can be protected as a digital object with someone who actually has dance and like links to these sort of traditional knowledges. But then suddenly we're like, oh, do we want to actually put um, put people's knowledges into these systems without? Um, so yeah, so we cut, so there's a few different things we wanted to be able to objectively research these new technologies, um, not put any real tradition, like real traditional knowledge through them. And also I think it's, this is just my personal touch, because I think it's really important to not consider traditional, I mean maybe you care about this as well, but, but uh, to not consider tradition as something purely in the past, like the stuff that happens today can be the tradition of the future, so it's important to think about tradition as something that moves forward rather than it's always something that you're looking back at. Um, yeah, so we made a fictional dance called the Bionic Step, which I'll link to at the end. Um, which is based on a few things, but I might, I mean, this is sort of the, the emote, the kind of fake emote. Um, I mean, it's a real note, actually, but it's fictional to a certain degree. Um, but in trying to create a 
fictional dance. Uh, even just kind of one of those, just like random stuff. And going back to sort of thinking about how uh, traditional dances are like not just made in a vacuum. They're, just, they're responding to to the environments that they're in. Um, we uh, sort of like to make a fictional world. So I'm going to take you to my next video, which is a nine minute. sets out like this world that this fictional dance comes from. Uh, so it was a bit, a bit quiet last time, I couldn't tell. Was it, it quiet or? Was it good the sound over there? But in here it was good. Was it yeah. Good? yeah. Okay. So just really quickly, I sort of, um, in building this fictional world and this fictional dance, I based it on um, a sort of past, present, and future. So wanting to kind of have a sort of like historical perspective of looking at um, where this dance might have come from, I based quite a lot of it on the dance of the play that happened in 1518. Um, and also it was interested in sort of Environments, I should say first, obviously, it, it, the, the movements are sort of based on this sort of slow motion phenomenon that's happening on TikTok. People are uh, moving in and out of slow motion, but it's like uh, they're doing it in real life. There's no effect that's happening on it. So I'm kind of thinking about, like, what does this, like, where does this come from? What's it saying about today? Um, and then I was thinking about this sort of environment that, that like, fosters um, dances to kind of catch and become... vertical idea but in this horizontal idea of like to for a dance to be successful for someone to be a well-known dancer it has to be copied and it has like loads of other people have to have done it for it to, to gain traction um so i was thinking about the dancing play sort of thinking about mm -hmm. if this was some form of tradition and if i could look back at something where this has happened before um and in researching the dancing play it was really interesting because as just a side note um the writer of the book i was reading was saying yeah, We have to understand that people can be believed in God and uh, they believe that there was something else that was deciding, deciding their fate. And also the times they were living at were like weirdly reminiscent of the times that we're living in now, like uh, a loss of faith in government, um, plagues and uh, revolutions. And not that we're living through revolutions, but there's definitely like sometimes it feels like on the internet like there are people that are unhappy. And um, and then also, kind of looking forward, I based a lot of this on, I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with Catherine Hale's work, she's a post-human theorist, I'm not sure what the book how it's post-human, but she has this idea of technical assemblages, she, uh, she writes about technical assemblages as kind of being this like moment that we live in now, where the human now, the evolution of human is like defined by, by evolving technology and she's kind of trying to like look at how we now define the human with we have to define the human with technology because it, like that's how we exist but she's also thinking about how do we define the human against technology and uh she introduces the idea of the new literacy so i'm kind of trying it's obviously it's not actually relevant to what we're here to talk about but uh the new literacy which is how right now we're at a state where can access we can access uh, information at the site of inscription at the site of inscription but we, there's like certain la layers of code that we're not able to access and in some cases like it's illegal to access certain like deeper like, levels of code. Um, and so we have to she proposes that we to reimagine the human as it's we're now not the only species with language and uh, we now need to think of what 
sets us apart from technology is that we enjoy mark making, not necessarily like creating a translatable meaning. That could be a whole other talk, so <laughs> I won't like go into that. Um, and then also I kind of based it a bit on the emergence of techno in post-industrial Detroit, thinking about this sort of emergence of a um, style of music that was kind of imitating the sounds of machines and thinking about this dance as a sort of imitation of a digital representation of the body. Um, so what, so speculatively, what would be the knowledge is worth protecting in this dance? Um, so we've got the separation of the human from technology, which it could be considered like, if we're looking at it in the form of traditional dance, could be warnings of the future, a cognitive coexistence with technology, um, stories of the past, which are um, human governance, which might not be a thing anymore, and uh, labor, which might not be, like technology and labor, which might not be a relationship that we have. And I only did two notes for this because then my quiche arrived and I wanted to have lunch. Um, <laughs> but uh, I was um, thinking about sort of like, what would be if we were to sort of, you know, be trying to contain these knowledges in this dance, how would we propose um, to Fortnite like how it would be you? So you, in thinking about putting these dances into the metaverse, could you could you give these dances powers or could they have some sort of function in these online spaces that reflect the knowledges that they hold? So it might not be completely linked to, but could they like stand in for some way? So I was thinking, you know, like this dance could um, give you the ability to become invisible to a weapon uh, in the sense that, you know, uh, we're now kind of like, we now enjoy mark making, so thinking about this dance in the form of mark making, but there's not actually any meaning behind it that, uh, that an algorithm could, to, could extract from it. Um, so therefore we kind of uh, are resisting sort of a techno-linguistic regime. Um, yeah, I mean these are just like, and then notified uh, woodloaded weapons are nearby, which could be um, more sort of a, a state of coexistence with technology. That's just two examples, but I think of course, we're quite far away from doing that, but I'm sort of kind of trying to bring it back to like beyond a monetary value. Also, what we're we trying to what are we trying to protect? And yeah, that's the end of my presentation. <laughs> So uh, just a, a clarification um, for those that have not been playing Fortnite, e-models are like these little capsules of movement that users can buy uh, to for their own avatars within the video game to perform the particular movement. Right? So in this case, it's like the creation of Nina and how this particular emote, what kind of uh, results or effects will have in the environment of such like a video game. So we do have a couple of minutes, so we can close this session in a session with some questions or comments from the audience as well. So tying this last bit that you said about um, what kind of value, not necessarily monetary value, we would like to protect. With a bit like earlier when you are bringing up traditional dances, mm. Um, and I'm assuming that in the context of traditional dances, um, they're not seen as a problem, right? They have other values behind them, um, other, you know, ways they, they fit into the society. And that, in comparison to this kind of current place we are at, where the main concern is actually it's taken for granted that the dance is a product almost, and the concern is like who is going to be paid for that product, right? But the questioning doesn't go beyond or after, like in your saying, you just take for granted that it is a product. And so, so I think that's so important to take into consideration this non-monetary values that are not associated with it concept of a product or, a, a, you know, by, by continuation, some kind of consumer type of society that we are immersed in. And, and, and that actually, when we first put that traditional dances as seen in the future, 
the first thing that I thought was even like that the present of now, you know, uh, is the past of the future, mm -hmm. but more of the thinking of the past and the types of values that are, that are part of our, are maybe the values and the thinking of the future and the kind of re, um, revaluing of these things. Sorry, is that, is, that, is, that, is that a question in there? No, okay. it was just a remark. I realized I was like, mm. that, that how do you think we're <laughs> tying into No, but maybe the question is, how do you see that um, it, this cycle, cycle of values and things in the past and the future in connection to, to dance? And I, I love this imagination of the future that we brought. And how would, in that future, for example, what kind of values would be important in your fiction exercise? Yeah, I mean, like, I think, like, I mean, I, I, like, in terms of what values would be important in, in that future world, I sort of, I, I almost need to, like, build it, more. I almost need to, like, build it more to really think about what they are to kind of, I, I thought that I'd just do it for this exercise, but now I'm kind of, like, really interested in this world yeah. that I've, like, set out, and I'm like, oh, I kind of want to, like, delve into it more, but, um, it's interesting, because I, I think, I can't remember was, but I was speaking to um, an artist, I can't remember his name, I was talking about our, our work with him, and he was talking about these traditional dance, like traditional dances and things, like, you do realize that there's some people that don't care about the monetary value of it, like, they don't want it to be a product, and they don't want it, like, that's a good, all of the, all, all of this, if, whether you're arguing one way or the other, it's, like, it's all blanket, like, if you're, like, if you want it to improve some people, might not be always about protecting the monetary value of something and being paid for something. It might be something that's actually more emotional to someone, that they don't want these things uh, being copied and reproduced um, for other reasons than just um, uh, than just money, like getting money from recognition for it. And that's kind of, that was a thing that I think kind of like started that, oh, oh obviously the stuff that we've been working with, but that was like that moment where I think drop of being like, oh, there's like, so there's something else at stake here, it's not just, it's not just money, of course money is like such an important, like you can't deny that it's an important thing, but I think, yeah, I think that's sort of, it's a harder, it's a harder problem to solve, it's mm -hmm. like, a, like, it's not as tangible as like, something that's monetary, but I think like, if we're looking at solving this sort of, being paid for your labor right. issue, right. why not? try and keep that conversation happening like alongside it. You might not, you might not get it perfect, but always keep it with you. Um, 